Welcome, Mark. Haven't seen you in a long while. Great to see you. Hope your family's well. And Eric, I like your beard. Good morning and welcome to Horizon Church. No, you're not here physically, but you're here with us, I hope, in spirit. Now, if you're watching this with us live, welcome. And if you're watching later in the day, welcome. We want to thank you guys for your continual giving during this time. I know it's uh, a little crazy with everything going on, but we just want to extend a thank you for y'all's uh, faithfulness in that. The call to worship this morning comes out of Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Good morning, Horizon. Let's lift our voices and sing to the God who is greater, he is higher, and he is mighty this morning. Sing this song that we all know so well. Healer, 
Father, we want to first and foremost thank you for your sovereignty and your dominion and, and your power over everything that has ever happened, that is happening, and that will ever happen. God, we know that you are in control and that you are providential in this time, and yet we still find ourselves questioning. Why are you letting this happen? What will come of it? What are we going to do in the midst of it? God, and I think about uh, the students here at Horizon, the youngest kids to the oldest about to graduate, and this has just put a wrench in their plans in their spring, and God, I ask that you give them your peace that passes all understanding, and I ask specifically for our students that they rest in your sovereignty throughout this time. And that even though that it's confusing and they're probably a little bit scared right now, God, that you give them the assurance that you are in control and that you are our refuge and strength, even in the midst of what's going on right now. Gracious Father in heaven, though we are apart, this church is worshiping you together in spirit and in truth. We come and we sing your praises and we adore you and our hearts are full of your love. You're so good to us. You protect us, you watch over us, you provide for us. This is tough for a lot of people right now who thrive off of socializing and spending time with one another and fellowshipping. We want to lift up this church body to you right now, the families, the individuals. We desperately need your encouragement and your strength. I ask, Lord, that you would shed your blessings on each member of this church family, on each individual family. Please, work in our hearts. Teach us to love one another as you have loved us. Use this time to grow us, to teach us patience, to teach us to depend on you in all things. Bless this time of worship now. 
bless your word as it is shared to us. And go with us as we go out this week in whatever capacity that we have. May we serve you and honor you and obey you in all things. Father, we thank you today for the means that you have blessed us with to proclaim your gospel even in times like we're going through right now with this coronavirus. God, we thank you not only for, for our church and for the technology to be able to still gather uh, online and uh, on our television sets. God, but thank you for all the churches across America today that are doing this right now. From pulpits all across America, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed. Uh, Lord, that's a beautiful thing, and your word does not return unto you void. And so, God, we pray for every service, not just ours, but every service that's going on right now across America, across this world, God. Uh, where the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached. God, would you work and would you move? Would you save? Uh, would you bring prodigals home today? Would you light a fire in your children, Lord? Would you revive us and our love and our affections for you? Uh, we pray that uh, for our church. We pray that for other churches. God, specifically today, we pray for those in our church that are hurting. We know that we have some folks in our our fellowship right now that have had ongoing illnesses that they're battling and they're dealing with God would you please pour out your mercy on them this day uh, we pray for those that just recently have begun to really struggle uh, with some health issues and you know who they are and they know who they are today and God I just pray that their hearts would be encouraged this morning uh, that your Holy Spirit would remind them that you are aware of what they're feeling and what they're going through and that you still have them in the palm of your hand uh, God, minister your grace, I pray right now, uh, for those in our, in our flock, God, that are just battling physical infirmities today, uh, for those that might be battling a financial situation today, God, with, with not being able to work. Uh, God, I just pray that you would meet that need in their life and in their family, uh, that they would grasp a hold of your word that says that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, so, God, please alleviate anybody today uh, who is burdened with financial stress in their life. And, um, God, lastly, I just want to pray today uh, for, for those in our church that uh, are involved in ministries that are paralyzed right now. I think of the Good News Club and, and those from our church that volunteer regularly there. And that's an outlet for them to be able to go and minister. And that's all been shut down right now. Would you encourage their hearts today? Uh, for, for those that, that are home right now and unable to go and, and, and fulfill what they feel like is their calling in their life. Uh, God, I pray for, for the Piedmont Women's Center and I pray for Miracle Hill and, and uh, all the other ministries that are connected to Horizon, uh, that you would just continue, Lord, to, uh, to pour out your grace and your mercy on the workers there and, and on those from our church that volunteer in those places. Uh, God, just continue to uh, give us all the grace we need to, to just be still during this time, know that you're in control, uh, and allow this to be a time, God, where we just kind of stockpile ammunition for when you release us again to go out and do the work of the kingdom. Uh, just continue, God, to, to minister grace to your people this day, we pray. And we thank you, God. We thank you for being called your children, for being adopted into your family, and God, we know that even our ability to praise you is only because you have opened our eyes to see your glory. And so this morning, as we continue to praise you, uh, we just ask for you, Lord, to uh, allow our praise to come before you as a sweet-smelling aroma. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to teach you a song this morning from Psalm 146. It's basically just Psalm 146, and we put a tune to it. Uh, and it's real easy to follow. Listen as we sing it through maybe one time, and then you'll join with us, I hope, uh, by the time we get to the second verse. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, while I live, I will ever praise Him, I will sing. Praises to my God, every breath, every word, every note, every chord, all my life I will praise the Lord. Happy is he whose hope is the Lord, the creator who made and sustains us. The heaven 
heavens and the earth in all fullness declare He is merciful, loving, and gracious. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord of oh my soul while I live. I will ever praise Him, I will sing praises to my God. Every breath, every word, every note, every chord of my life I will praise the Lord. He opens the eyes of those who are blind. He strengthens the weak and the humble. He loves all the righteous and watches their way, but he causes the wicked to stumble. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord of my soul while I live. I will ever praise him, I will sing praises to my God. Every breath, every word, every note, every chord, all my life I will praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord of my soul while Him, I will sing praises to my God. Every breath, every word, every note, every chord of my life, I will praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, God. Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for the water. So my soul longeth after you, O oh God. Our souls long for you, God. They pan for you, the living God. Would you fill us today, Lord? Not for tranquility. Not for prosperity, not for equality, do I approach your throne. Not for my wealth or gain, or freedom from my pain. But my request today is quench my thirsty soul. My soul longs for you. My soul pants for you. My soul thirsts for you. Hear my desperate cry. When I don't long for you, when I don't ache for you, Lord, do what you must do to capture my desires. And not for applause of men, or lords that I might gain but for your presence Lord I come before you now and when nothing else satisfies when tears flow day and night I can rise to the highest heights when at your feet I bow. My soul longs for you. My soul pants for you. My soul thirsts for you. Hear my desperate cry. When I don't long for you, when I don't ache for you, Lord, do what you must 
must do to capture my desire. Sing that last line with us. Lord, do what you must do to capture my desires. Lord, do what you must do. Do whatever you have to do. Lord, do what you must do to capture my desires. Do it, God. Oh, Lord, how awesome would it be if you would use the coronavirus to capture our desires? to bring us to a place in you this morning where we are able to have more intimate fellowship than we have ever had with you before. So God, it's our prayer today as we draw near to you during this time, you would draw near to us. Would you pour out your spirit on our service today? Would you anoint Jim as he comes to preach the word that you've put on his heart? We know that your word is living. We know that it's powerful. We know that it's alive. Would you allow it to come alive in us this morning as Jim preaches? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Scott and Tara and Gordon for leading us in worship to the very throne of God. Before we look into God's word, consider it. I'd like to lead us in prayer one more time. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, this is your day, the Lord's day, a heavenly opportunity to rest, the open door of worship, the celebration of Jesus' resurrection, the promise of the Sabbath to come, the day when saints, fighting the good fight of faith, and saints already in glory, unite we unite in endless praise. Thank you for that privilege. We thank you for your throne of grace where your free favor reigns to your people. We thank you for the wide open access to it through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you grant us the blessings that this day was designed to deliver. We ask that you'd flood our minds with peace beyond understanding. We pray that you would bless your word as it is brought, may our meditation be sweet and our acts of worship be life and liberty and joy. May our food be your precious word, our defense, the shield of faith. We pray sincerely that you would bind our hearts closer and closer to our Lord Jesus, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. Everywhere we turn these days, it seems the phrase is jumping out at us that this is the new normal. It seems that it's the latest entry into the English lexicon. Because of the effects, we're told, of the Wuhan virus, why we're supposed to be experiencing a new normal. Social distancing, social isolation, uh, sheltering in place, staying at home, safer at home, self-quarantining, uh, flattening the curve. But more and more as I hear that phrase, something in me just rises up, some intuitive pushback. And I ask myself, why should such a harmless, such a benign phrase ruffle my feathers so? Could it be that it's because words that we utter, or words that we splash across a page, have a superpower to subtly, very sneakily, reshape our reality and our worldview. When we state out loud that our current reality is the new normal, why then we start believing something that isn't true. And that is all this worry and fear is normal. And it isn't. But this new buzz phrase, new normal, it got me to thinking about 
us, we who follow Jesus Christ, committed followers, we who believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the eternal Son of God who came to earth, God in flesh, very God, and yet a real man. We who believe that he died to rescue for eternity, all of us who repent of our sins and put our trust in him. We who believe that we are in the world, but not of the world, as Jesus prayed to his father in John chapter 17. But the current reality for us, followers of Jesus, collectively, is that we are, in fact, very much of the world. And it's probably nowhere more apparent than in the arena of sexual morality. In many churches today, there's a vicious cycle where pastors are quick to welcome everyone of every kind of background to worship with them, but then the pastor will pull his punches when he preaches and he'll fail to declare biblical morality and the truths of God's word because he doesn't want to offend. Why We here at Horizon Church, and me personally, I want to welcome people of all backgrounds with all your baggage. We want you to come to hear the words of life, words of hope. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to pull any punches I'm going to declare boldly and perhaps bluntly God's standards. And it's going to challenge your perspectives towards sexuality, for instance, and the Bible's expectation for normal in the life of the believer. Now, if you're not a believer and you're tuning in, thanks for tuning in. I, I get it. But you might be curious as to how we followers of Jesus think God wants us to live. And right now you're probably a little confused because when you look out to the Christian landscape and you see those professing believers who are all over the map on this, they think and behave in ways that are not matching our agreed upon standard. Now you might ask, what is our agreed upon standard and what is normal for a Christian? Well, for the answer to that, we must go to the book that we believe is the authentic and authoritative Word of God. The Bible, it's our standard. It tells us what is normal. And so this morning, we pick up in our study of the book of Hebrews. Now, we took a break for Easter and the two Sundays after Easter. But this morning, we return to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Now, Joe had led us into verses 1 through 3 of this chapter. And today we pick up with just one verse, the fourth verse of Hebrews chapter 13. Hear now the reading of God's word. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. This is the word of God. The grass withers and the flower falls but the word of God abides forever. And so this text tells us that marriage is to be honored by all. Now that word honor literally means in the Greek precious or costly or valuable. The apostle Peter uses it when he speaks of the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the costly blood. And then he goes on in 2 Peter chapter 1 to talk about the precious and exceedingly great promises that God has for his people. So the word honor means precious, costly, valuable. And we should honor marriage because God honors marriage. He ordained it in the garden before sin ever entered the world. He saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone. And so he created Eve. We see in the scriptures that all three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, creating the institution of marriage in the very beginning, in the garden, and then we see Jesus the Son honoring marriage at the wedding of Cana, where he performed his first public miracle. And then we see how he honored marriage in the way that he challenged the lax practices about divorce in the first century among the Jews of Israel. He challenged those. And then we see God the Holy Spirit honoring marriage 
when he inspires the Apostle Paul to write that marriage is an earthly picture of Jesus Christ and his church. Well, according to the Bible then, marriage is to be honored. It's a lifelong covenant between a man and a woman, according to Malachi chapter 2 and verse 14. So sexual unity, physical intimacy between a man and a woman is to be celebrated only within the bounds of marriage. And that's a covenant relationship. Now, the writer of Hebrews uses the term marriage bed as a euphemism for physical intimacy or sex in marriage. And the Bible plainly states that sex is reserved for marriage. Now, I know that that sounds terribly archaic to many people in our culture, to you who may be viewing this morning. I know that makes me look like a mouth-breathing Neanderthal. But it is the Word of God. And I tell you, friends, I'm going to stand and give an account for my stewardship one day. And I want to be faithful in declaring what God's Word says, no matter what society may think of it. Do you know that it's no wonder then that 61% of Christians say that they'd have sex before marriage. And another 56% of Christian young people said that uh, it's okay to live together if you've been dating at least six months. So it's no wonder that living together has replaced marriage as the most common relationship experience among young adults. Well, to put it plainly, again, sex outside of marriage is sin. But it's what the Bible says. You, you might not like that. You have to perform mental gymnastics, though, to get around it, to conclude otherwise. So what about some of the things that the Bible mentions about marriage that make us scratch our head? What about polygamy, for instance? Having more than one wife. It was tolerated in the Old Testament, wasn't it? Yes, but there's not a single example of a harmonious polygamous marriage. It's always created problems. It's not the way God intended it. For he brought one woman to the one man. The two shall become one. One flesh. And so polygamy was never part of God's design. Although he tolerated it, it brought problems. And then people ask about divorce. What about divorce? Well, God certainly tolerates divorce under certain conditions, but Jesus said it always reflects the hardness of the human heart. God clearly states in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16 that he hates divorce. But if you've been divorced, my Christian friend, you're not a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. You know, some of my best friends have been divorced, and I watch them serve fruitfully and faithfully in God's kingdom. But I'm sure that they'd counsel others about the pain, about the regret and the scars that accompany a broken relationship. Then some people would ask, well, what about homosexual marriage? Well, very simply, there's no biblical basis for it. In fact, homosexuality is condemned as a sin in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Again, I know that makes me appear to be a knuckle-dragging troglodyte, but it's what the Bible says. Now, homosexuals may be joined in a civil union, but it's not a marriage. It's more of a mirage. But if we're supposed to honor marriage, what are the ways in which we dishonor marriage? One way is by assuming that, assuming that celibacy is a, a more spiritual state. Well, the Bible is clear that celibacy is a gift from God. It enables one to remain single and to control sexual desire. It enables one to give themselves perhaps more fully to the Lord because they don't have so many other things to think about. But relatively few people have this gift, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And Paul specifically condemns those who forbid marriage in 1 Timothy 4.3. Well, despite Paul's warning, the early church did view celibacy as a superior spiritual state. I think of the situation with 
Augustine, that great Christian philosopher, who, when he came to faith in Jesus Christ, when he was converted, he gave up his longtime mistress with whom he had had a son. He thought he had to be celibate in order to follow Christ. But that's one area of thinking where the great Christian thinker got it wrong. He should have married that woman who was his mistress. Regrettably, he and others of his time viewed sex in marriage as a necessary evil for the purpose only of procreation. They failed to see it as God's gift to be enjoyed. And then the stipulation by the Roman church that priests and nuns would have to forego marriage on earth only adds to the confusion that people think the celibate state is a superior spiritual state. It is not. And the great Martin Luther upset the ecclesiastical apple cart when he married a former nun. And then he celebrated the conjugal blessings of marital love as a blessing from God and in accordance with Scripture. Luther celebrated it and preached it and practiced it, and he was right about that. Well, what's another way in which we can dishonor marriage? Not only is it by assuming that celibacy is somehow more spiritual, but by following society's easy-come, easy-go attitude towards uh, divorce. And I know that many Christians have been divorced. And if you, you have been this morning, I uh, know that if you could, you'd turn back the clock and you'd do things differently. And I don't want to add to your pain. Nevertheless, we must affirm the biblical standard. And as God's people, we've got to reverse the trend of the last 50 years. People should be able to look at Christian marriages and marvel that we've been able to love one another and stay together and work through the problems because of the covenant we've entered into with one another and before Almighty God. A covenant that involves God himself, our spouse, and us. And so the easy-come attitude in American culture about marriage and divorce, we've got to change the thinking by living lives that are in obedience and conformity to God's Word. And then another way in which we dishonor marriage, we fail to honor it, as our text says, is by marrying an unbeliever. Do you know that God calls this an abomination? But many Christians think nothing of marrying an unbeliever. Paul makes it clear that we're only free to marry in the Lord in 1 Corinthians 7 and 2 Corinthians 6. But marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, and it ruins that picture when we marry an unbeliever. According to the report I referenced earlier, 34% of young Christians respond that it's a good thing to marry someone of the same faith, but it's not required. And you know, sometimes the soon-to-be-married will admit that the, though the fiancé is not a believer, is not a professing Christian, still they have peace about it. Well, whatever peace that is, it's never a peace from God. He does not condone sin. And you and your children will suffer the consequences. Well, the question is, what if you're already married to an unbeliever? Well, the Bible says that you ought to try and make that marriage work. Do all you can to remain in that marriage if possible. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, the truth is God may give your spouse a new heart, may convert your husband or wife. But stories of God's grace to convert the unbelieving spouse never justify marrying an unbeliever in the first place. So one of the ways that we dishonor marriage is be, by being unequally yoked. For what concordance does light have with darkness? Another way we dishonor marriage is by having sex outside the marriage covenant. Now, this is the main point of the text here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. The first and second parts of the verse match up. They correspond. For uh, the word here that's used in some translation, fornicators, it's the Greek word pornus, and it simply means the immoral, it covers several uh, categories of sexual immorality. Um, the King James uses the term whoremongers, but it refers to single people who have sex outside of marriage. 
they dishonor marriage. And then it speaks of the moikus, the adulterers. This is, of course, referring to married people who have sex with someone other than their spouse. And so if, if the pornus or the fornicators, if they dishonor marriage, then the adulterers defile the marriage bed. And so you see that first and second part of the verses match up. But we're talking about sex outside of marriage. And of course, it's everywhere in our society. It seems to be celebrated in films and literature. Well, why is sex so cheap in America? One reason is because women today expect very little in return. There was a time when women demanded more care, more attention, more commitment and fidelity. They served as the gatekeepers to the sexual marketplace. <laughs> but data shows that women today give sex away for next to nothing. And then they wonder why they find dating so frustrating and marriage so elusive. Well, the sexual revolution promised women sexual and economic freedom. And they have gotten both. But it's also handed the keys to the marriage market to men. You know, the average man's age in his first marriage these days is almost 30 years of age. Back in the 50s, it was age 22. And, you know, some men balk at marriage because of the ball and chain myth that uh, they'll be enslaved for the rest of their life to one woman. And they can't imagine that. But studies show that married men make more money than single men, unmarried men, that they accumulate more wealth, three times more by age 50, that they live longer by 10 years, that they manage illness better than never married men, and uh, that they show more satisfaction sexually with physical intimacy with their wives than single men confess to. But the reality today is that 51% of marriages end in divorce. So the odds are not good for a successful marriage. How can you be sure that your marriage will succeed when so many fail? Well, getting back to this text, this simple text, we can consider some ways that we honor marriage. One way is by guarding ourselves from sexual sin. And all sin begins in our minds. So to guard ourselves, we must turn from it as soon as it enters our minds. And Jesus made that point very graphically when he said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And that's from Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30, from the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus didn't mean to literally maim yourself, but he was emphasizing the serious nature of sexual fantasies. Jesus said, if you don't stop, the consequence is hell. So maybe we need to start avoiding so many TV shows and movies that we stream that tempt us to lust. Maybe we should use filters on our computers, devices, to block pornography. In his autobiography, Just As I Am, the late Billy Graham discussed the resolutions that the core members of his evangelistic team made back in 1948 as they were set to do a campaign in Modesto, California. Their resolutions became known as the Modesto Manifestation. And Billy wrote in his autobiography, the second item on the list was the danger of sexual immorality. Now, we pledged among ourselves to avoid any situation that would even have the appearance of compromise or suspicion. From that day on, I did not travel, meet, or eat alone with a woman other than my wife. We determined that the Apostle Paul's mandate to the young pastor Timothy would be ours as well. Flee youthful lusts. And so that Modesto Manifesto 
is what guided the Billy Graham team for years without any uh, slander, without any great compromise. God preserved them as they gave themselves. Now, I admit, with women having entered in the workforce today, this becomes much harder than it used to be. But um, Billy and his team managed to, uh, to evade scandal by giving themselves to the principles of God's word. And so they were very careful. And so we need to guard our hearts from sin. Another way is we can memorize scripture because it has the power to transform our minds. The Bible, the psalmist says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11. Here's another way to honor and secure your marriage that's implied here by our text, and that is to enjoy the total marriage, including the physical intimacy, including the sex. Sadly, the history of the church reveals a far uh, less positive attitude to sex than the Bible itself. With few exceptions, the early church fathers and the medieval Theologians condemned the sensual pleasures of intercourse as sinful. And they were hung up on celibacy. And so their attitude towards marriage, sadly, regrettably, was ambivalent at best. But the Bible actually celebrates the pleasures of the sexual relationship in marriage for both men and women. You check out the Song of Solomon, for instance. It extols the joy of sex for both partners. And Paul tells both husbands and wife that they don't have authority over their own bodies. No, but their spouse has the authority over their body. And so that's a real preventive to immorality. And Abraham's wife, Sarah, she referred to sexual relationship with her husband as, quote, having pleasure with him. So the Bible takes a positive view of sex within marriage, doesn't it? There's something else that this verse tells us. It says that God will judge those who dishonor marriage by sexual immorality. In fact, the Bible hammers this point home over and over again, eight different times in the New Testament. We see it. And while believers do not need to fear God's eternal judgment, still, Scripture is clear that if you continually dishonor marriage, you may not be a genuine believer at all. You may not be a Christian, according to 1 John 3, 7 through 10. And if you are a true Christian, God will lovingly discipline you in the here and now. And it may not feel at all like love when you're going through it. Well, while God does forgive us, we may still feel the effects of our sin. Certainly that was the case with David. That was given to us, that truth, part of his life which he fumbled so badly, sinned against God. We see the effects that it brought. And so the Bible teaches us through the example of both the villains and the heroes what God's standards are and what his expectations and what his normal is for us. You know, talking about the effects of sin, there are some sexual diseases that are untreatable, even fatal. Some will protest, but, but aren't we under grace? Yes, we are. And yet the very book that explains the grace of God and celebrates God grace, God's grace, Galatians, says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. But there is good news for all who have bought our culture's lies and regret it deeply. And that good news is that God will forgive all who repent of their sin and turn to Jesus Christ. You know, immediately following the Apostle Paul's warning of God's judgment on sexual immorality, he adds this in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, And such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God.
Friends, that is great good news. It tells us that there's no kind of sexual perversion that's beyond God's forgiveness, no matter how in the past you may have dishonored marriage. If you turn to Christ, repent of your sin, He'll welcome you. And He graciously promises this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Yes, friend, you can experience God's forgiveness and His gift of eternal life as you turn from your sin and trust in the person and work of the eternal Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. And so the bottom line is that our culture is groping in moral darkness. And the current reality is not our new normal. It is not normal for the believer. But if we who claim to love and follow the risen Lord Jesus will just embrace His will for us, surrender our passions and our desires to Him, and let Him direct us, He'll use us to shine in this dark world with the great good news of forgiveness and new life in Jesus Christ, and that marriages can actually thrive as we honor Him. May it ever be so. God help us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Spirit, please drive it deep into our hearts. Give us the grace to trust and obey. of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me
say, Jim, I've dishonored marriage most of my life. Is there any hope for me? That's why we're preaching this to you. There is hope and there is grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of us desperately need His grace. And you cannot say that God does not love you, for He proved it by sending His only Son to die for sinners like you and like me. We turn from our sin and receive him and ask him to give us the power and the grace to embrace his heart for us. The promises that he gives us are literally out of this world. But now hear this good word from God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.